Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. So Croesus is a name that is now most commonly referenced when someone wants to shorthand that a person is ridiculously wealthy. That is a thing that uh, it happens sometimes in English language, but other languages use it all the time. And I think possibly a little bit more than English speakers. Um, And he is one of those historical figures who is both real and has taken on a mythical status. Also mythical, Aesop was a member of his court. I mean, there's all (laughs) kinds of mythical swirlings around him. But the story of the ridiculously wealthy Croesus, which was likely fictionalized in a number of ways, and we'll talk about that, also becomes this sort of cautionary tale about pride and hubris and what really has value in life. So Croesus was born into the royal family of Lydia. Lydia was a kingdom that occupied the western section of Anatolia. Roughly speaking, in modern shorthand, we're talking about the left half of the Asia Minor Peninsula, so it's part of modern-day Turkey. To the west sat the Greeks, and to the east were the lands of Persia. The Lydia that Croesus was born into was very prosperous. When Phrygia, which had been the dominant power on the peninsula since around 1200 BCE, was attacked by Sumerians and fell from power circa 700 BCE, Lydia became the most powerful kingdom in the region. It's kind of filled that power vacuum. And at that point, it was ruled by King Gyges from the newly established Lydian capital of Sardis. This also established the Mermnad dynasty. After Gyges came Ardis in the mid-7th century BCE, followed by Sidiades, and then Aliades. Aliades was Croesus's father, and it's under Aliades that Lydia is said to have really hit its apex in terms of power and prosperity. The exact dates for the reigns of those kings are pretty fuzzy, The main source that's used for them is from Herodotus, but if you do the math based on the counts of the years that he uses, that math does not quite add up. Also, just in general, Herodotus sometimes would like to say, this is how I heard it. Yes, 100%. It's one of those things where he is listed as a great historian, but as we'll discuss later, (laughs) there's definitely some... um, some flexibility with the record, (laughs) like what serves his purpose. But what is less fuzzy is the fact that during the years from 700 BCE to Croesus becoming king circa 560 BCE, Lydia had established itself as a very prosperous commercial culture. It is one of the earliest cultures known to have instituted the concept of retail shops, like permanent stores, and the Lydians were minting coinage way ahead of the rest of the Western world. There is evidence of Chinese coinage that predates the Lydians, although the coins that were minted specifically under Croesus more closely resemble what we would think of today as coinage. When Aliates died in 560 BCE, Croesus became king, and he was 35 at the time. And Croesus was, like a lot of people in his day, very into using things like dreams and oracles to predict the future. He had two sons. One of them is described, again, by Herodotus, as having a very minor disability. And this is treated just horribly within the text. Croesus says, quote, since he is ruined, he doesn't exist for me. Yeah, there's a whole side story about his son that I may be going to save for our casual Friday chat. Um... It's a weird thing. But the other son that he had, Addis, was much beloved and was the king's pride. And when Croesus had a dream that showed Addis being killed by an iron spear, Croesus then did everything in his power to shelter his son. He arranged for a speedy marriage to give him a home life, and he stopped tasking him with going out into battle, and he basically tried to keep him safe and at home all the time. But ultimately, Croesus did allow Attis to go on a hunt, and this was at his son's request and after much debate, because Attis was sort of feeling like, hey, I don't have anything to be proud of in our culture at this point because you won't let me go to war and I can't even go outside. This stinks. Uh, So he allowed him to go on this hunt, and of course another hunter's spear missed the wild boar that they were hunting and killed Attis. And Croesus reportedly mourned this son for two full years. Lydia is usually cited as the first kingdom to mint metal coinage. 
Uh, under Croesus, the first silver and gold coins for Lydia were made. Uh, and this is kind of reminding us a little bit of the many episodes where we have talked about the gold standard being challenged by the silver standard in the United States and how much strife came out of all that. Those precious metals were part of tender going all the way back to the 6th century BCE. Yeah, and the coin type known as a Cresid, featuring a face-off between a lion and a bull, was developed during this time. And the representation of the lion actually served as a means to indicate the purity and the value of the coin. So a smaller piece of the lion's body would be stamped on a coin to indicate that that coin was a smaller denomination than one with a larger, more complete image of a lion. And the Lydians really made great strides under Croesus in the purification of gold, enabling them to ensure accuracy in these different coins. This is basically the beginning of the gold standard. And the wealth was incredible. Another name that you've almost certainly heard in connection with ridiculous levels of riches is King Midas. And Croesus's very great wealth is said to have come from Midas in a way. The Mermnad dynasty allegedly got its extraordinary riches in part by collecting it from the river Pactolus, where Midas is said to have washed his hands. There were also some taxes, plundering other kingdoms, including enslaving people from those kingdoms. Yeah, they actually gained their riches in a number of ways, but that Midas story is one that persists. And what defines much of what we know of the rule of Croesus is war. And it's said that conflict was ultimately what brought Croesus out of his mourning state over his son. Once he was refocused on military leadership, Croesus was eager to expand his power, and he could be ruthless in this quest. Herodotus wrote this of him, quote, This Croesus was the first foreigner whom we know who subjugated some Greeks and took tribute from them and won the friendship of others, the former being the Ionians, the Aeolians, and the Dorians of Asia, and the latter, the Lacedaemonians. Before the reign of Croesus, all Greeks were free, for the Sumerian host which invaded Ionia before his time did not subjugate the cities, but raided and robbed them. Yeah, so keep in mind, uh, as we talk about Croesus, and he's an interesting figure, but he was very big on enslavement as something new. That was not a tradition. That was something he uh, instituted in his war-making. So we mentioned a moment ago that Croesus believed in oracles, but he really wanted to run a test to ensure that the oracle that he would patronize was going to be the best one. So Herodotus wrote that Croesus sent men out to various shrines, but after they left the palace at Sardis, they had to bide their time for a hundred days So they didn't know what Croesus was doing before going to these shrines. And then on the hundredth day, each oracle was supposed to be asked to divine what Croesus was doing at that very moment. And then all of these messengers would bring back the divinations and it would be obvious which oracle or oracles were the real deal. The men who had visited the Oracle of Delphi at the Temple of Apollo came back with the following verse, quote, I know the number of the grains of sand and the extent of the sea, and understand the mute and hear the voiceless. The smell has come to my senses of a strong-shelled tortoise boiling in a cauldron together with a lamb's flesh, under which is bronze and over which is bronze. We don't know what any of the others divined, because this one was apparently spot on. Croesus said that the oracle of Amphiaris had also given a, quote, true answer, but we don't know the wording of what that answer specifically was. But in an effort to concoct a strange enough event that it would be impossible to guess what he had been doing, Croesus had cut up a tortoise and a lamb and boiled them together in a covered bronze cauldron. So... Let's move along from that less than pleasant image and take a quick break and have a word from some of the sponsors that keep Stuff You Missed in History Class going. So Croesus was devoted to the Oracle of Delphi after it had successfully uh, passed this test. He sacrificed literally thousands of animals, and burned almost every valuable thing he could lay hands on. He also commanded the citizens of Lydia to do the same, and he sent so much gold to the temple. (laughs) Uh, There is a line in the translation that I read that stated, quote, moreover, he dedicated his own wife's necklaces and girdles. 
which I just found funny as things to sacrifice to Apollo. (laughs) So the goal of all of these offerings was to ensure that Croesus got good advice from the oracle regarding his military plans, and the people he tasked with bringing his many gifts to the temple were instructed to get this advice. Two points came back. One was that if Croesus were to attack the Persians, crossing a river to do so, he would destroy a great empire. And two, that he should make friends with the most powerful Greeks. So at this point in time, the power of the Persians, led by Cyrus II, also known as Cyrus the Great, was expanding. We actually talked at some length about Cyrus II in our episode on the Achaemenid Empire in 2016. Croesus, of course, wanted to curtail the expansion of the Persian Empire, and he started a campaign of his own to make sure that Cyrus II's forces did not get close to Lydia. So Croesus asked the oracle to once again tell him the future. They sent messengers to Delphi to ask if his reign would be a long one, and the reply was, quote, When the Medes have a mule as king, just then tender-footed Lydian, by the stone-shrewn Hermes, flee and do not stay, and do not be ashamed to be a coward. Croesus took this pretty literally, and he thought, well, a mule is never going to be a king, so this must be telling me that my rule is going to be very, very long, and I have a a lot of power ahead of me. So bolstered and confident, he continued his military campaigning. Over the course of his rule, Croesus had attacked Ephesus, then Ionian cities, then the cities of Aeolia. According to Herodotus, all of these attacks were based on some sort of reason. And in his words, quote, he found graver charges where he could, but sometimes alleged very petty grounds of offense. (laughs) Yeah, the justified invasions were pretty lightly justified in some cases. So next... Croesus set his sights on the islands of Greece as a target, and he knew that he was going to need to assemble a navy fleet to conquer them. So he started up a shipbuilding project. But while this was all underway, he was approached by a man from the Lesbos capital of Mytilene, whose name was either Priene or Pittacus, depending on the source that you read. And this man told Croesus that the islanders were actually amassing their own ground forces to attack Croesus at Sardis. Croesus replied essentially that he wished they would do that because his troops would destroy the islanders who had no experience in ground battle warfare. In response to this, the emissary from Mytilene pointed out that in starting a navy from scratch, Croesus would be similarly disadvantaged if he tried to take on the islander forces. So this put an end to Croesus's navy project, and he opted instead to form an alliance with the Ionian islanders. <laughs> This story cracks me up. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah, come at me on land. And they're like, that's what we say about you coming at us on sea, dude. Yeah. <laughs> you, you are not going to manage this. During his time as king of Lydia, Croesus eventually became the ruler of most of the nations and peoples on the peninsula west of the Halys River. That was the name of what is now known as the Kazilermak River. Persians conquered the Median Empire in 550 BCE, and this was a sobering event for Croesus. It became immediately apparent that his own power could also be challenged by the Persian forces. This led him to try to fortify his own strength through an alliance, and this goes back to that advice that he got from the Oracle of Delphi to befriend the most powerful Greek state. So Croesus had already made an alliance with Amasis, the king of Egypt, and he also got the Lacedaemonians and then the Spartans, which he believed to be the most powerful Greek state, to agree to stand with him. But Croesus was not really content with waiting to see what would happen with the Persians and getting all of these alliances arranged, and he was very impatient. So he just decided that he would go right on ahead and invade Anatolia. He decided to invade Anatolia, specifically Cappadocia, in the eastern part of the territory. And that meant he had to cross the Halys River. And the battle that ensued at Teria was not what anybody had hoped. It sort of ended in a draw. After Teria, Croesus wanted to regroup. So he had summoned all of those groups that he had allied with to join him in the springtime, five months after he sent these messages out to them, so that they would have time to assemble their armies and travel after the winter. And so then he took his own troops and headed back to Sardis. But apparently he didn't realize that Cyrus II and his Persian troops had followed him home. When Sardis was attacked by Persia, it came just as a complete surprise to Croesus. 
The Lydians scrambled to meet the Persians in battle, and according to Herodotus, Cyrus was afraid of the Lydians. But on the advice of a Median who was with him, Cyrus put his cavalry on the pack camels. And the camels drove back the Lydian horses because apparently the horses were afraid of the camels and their smell, and they retreated even as their riders tried to move them forward into battle. The Lydian army was forced to fight on foot, and ultimately they were defeated by the Persians. Croesus sent word to his allies to come and help, but efforts at assistance were not enough or came too late. Croesus was taken captive, and Sardis was taken by the Persians after two weeks of this conflict. So when the Oracle of Delphi had told Croesus about crossing a river and destroying a kingdom, oops, that was his own kingdom that would be destroyed. And that story of the mule leading the Medes empire. Cyrus II was half Medes and half Persian, the child of two different groups of people. So the mule reference was kind of a casual, like, slurry representation. Croesus had, in his literalism, in interpreting all of these words of the oracle, failed to catch any of the actual meaning in the oracle's words. We will talk about the varied accounts of the end of Croesus' life after we pause and have a quick sponsor break. In 546 BCE, with his defeat by Cyrus II and the Persian army, the reign of Croesus ended. But what happened after this invasion is something that, again, is a little unclear, and that's because there are a number of different versions of the story. Bacchylides, a poet from Greece, tells the story in the Odes of the Epinetians that Croesus built his own funeral pyre and then tried to burn himself to death on it, And this was, according to his writing, unsuccessful because the gods intervened before Croesus actually met his final end. Yes, in that history, it's written, quote, When he had come to that unexpected day, Croesus had no intention of waiting any longer for the tears of slavery. He had a pyre built before his bronze-walled courtyard, and he mounted the pyre with his dear wife and his daughters with beautiful hair. They were weeping inconsolably. He raised his arms to the steep sky and shouted, Overweening deity, where is the gratitude of the gods? Where is Lord Apollo? So just as Croesus had gotten a trusted servant to really get the flames going, and as his wife and daughters were looking on in tears, the deus ex machina arrives. Quote, But when the flashing force of terrible fire began to shoot through the wood, Zeus set a dark rain cloud over it and began to quench the golden flame. Nothing is unbelievable, which is brought about by the god's ambition. Then Apollo shows up, scoops up Croesus and his family, and carries them north to Hyperborea, the land of the giants, where they can live safely. So we know that this particular version of the story became an important part of Greek lore. This moment is represented on a piece of art in the Louvre decorated by Mizon, a painter who decorated vases in Athens using what is known as red figure technique. And Mizon's work on the vase that depicts this particular subject is dated in the 500 to 490 BCE range. So we're talking 50 to 60 years after Croesus' defeat would have happened. This vase shows Croesus sitting on a throne, pouring out a libation onto the servant Eudemos, while Eudemos is lighting the pyre that the throne has been placed upon. There's an inscription on the vase that specifically names the king in the image as Croesus, so it's not a case of like, well, this could be Croesus. The opposite side of the vase has a totally different and unrelated scene showing Theseus abducting the Amazon Antiope. If you're ever in Paris and you want to see it, it is part of the Greek, Etruscan, and Roman Antiquities collection and is on the first floor in the Selly Wing, room 652. So after this happened and Croesus was saved by the gods, the story goes that Croesus became an ally of the leader who followed Cyrus, that was Cambyses II. And along with Cambyses II, Croesus, in this version, then traveled to Egypt. That is not the only version of this story where Croesus ends up friends with his former enemy state. The Persian doctor Cetesius, who was born in Greece, wrote an account that suggests that Croesus actually became part of Cyrus's court and eventually rose to a point of good enough standing that he was appointed governor of Barini. Part of what makes the Croesus story so tricky to unravel is the fact that he was such a big figure culturally that people essentially started writing fan fiction about him. 
And now when we reference it hundreds of years later, it's a little hard to know which is fan fiction versus which is uh, actual historical record. And we mentioned one version of his fate that was written by Herodotus just a moment ago, but that was not the only writing that Herodotus did featuring Croesus as a protagonist. In another story by Herodotus, Croesus met with Solon, the lawmaker of Athens, whose life ended just as Croesus's reign was starting. And this is really a parable about values and happiness. There's really no evidence that any of it actually took place. In the story, Solon, like a lot of important men of the day, decided to visit Croesus when the Lydian king was at the height of his power. So there's actually sort of a fun side story here about why Solon, the lawmaker, would have been out and about traveling. This kind of, you know, justifies how this may have worked in the the writing of Herodotus. So this travel was part of a 10-year trip. The idea was that once Solon had made all of the laws that he believed Athens needed to be a fair and just society, he promised to stay away from Athens for 10 years so that he would not be tempted to change or repeal any of those laws. Athens wanted to live by this set of laws that Solon had carefully penned, and so they promised to do so, and they were not themselves allowed to make any changes. An interesting governmental experiment, to be sure, and yes, Solon is certainly on my list for his own episode one day. There's no telling when that might happen. (laughs) In any case, after receiving Solon, Croesus basically spent the whole visit entertaining his visitor and then making the household staff point out all the expensive things that Croesus had just lying around the palace so that Solon would understand just how rich and successful the king was. And after this little exercise in wealth show and tell, Croesus asked Solon, quote, My Athenian guest, we have heard a lot about you because of your wisdom and of your wanderings. How, as one who loves learning, you have traveled much of the world for the sake of seeing it. So now I desire to ask you, who is the most fortunate man you have seen? And of course, the king expected that the lawmaker was going to say, oh, it's you for sure. Dude, you have everything. Like, there's no reason anybody could ever be any happier than you. But he did not say that. Solon instead named an Athenian called Tellus as the most fortunate man he knew. King Croesus asked for an explanation of Solon's answer. And the lawmaker told him that Tellus had been part of a prosperous city, a good community, and that he had children who grew up to be good people and all gave him grandchildren, and that all of his progeny survived. And then when Tellus died in battle against the people of Eleusis, it was a good and honorable death, and that he was honored in his burial. So after hearing this, Croesus, apparently hoping that he would get a second place spot, then asked Solon who he thought was the next most fortunate man. And Solon gave two men's names in answer, Clebus and Biton of Argive. These two brothers had a stable home life. They were physically very strong, and they both died after pulling their mother in a wagon five miles to the festival of Hera in Argos, as the oxen that were intended to convey her were not back from the fields in time to do so. Before Clebus and Biton died, everyone present commented that their mother had raised great children, and then she prayed to Hera to grant her sons the best thing for a man. And they both died in their sleep that night after the evening's feast. Here's how Herodotus uh, renders the speech about this. Quote, Croesus, you ask me about human affairs, and I know that the divine is entirely grudging and troublesome to us. Croesus, man is entirely chance. To me, you seem to be very rich and to be king of many people, but I cannot answer your question before I learn that you ended your life well. He explains in the story that wealth is not what leads to happiness and that one should focus instead on good fortune in a more expansive sense. So the advice that Solon allegedly gave to Croesus was, quote, count no man happy until his death. That story actually feeds into a version of the tale of Cyrus having Croesus burned alive, in which Croesus has a moment of revelation related to Solon's teaching as he is being executed. In this version, as Croesus begins to call out Solon's name while on the pyre, Cyrus asks why that was the name he invoked, and he was moved by Croesus' realization that wealth was meaningless in that moment. Croesus, then released from his execution by Cyrus, then asks Cyrus what his soldiers are doing. And when Cyrus responds that they are sacking the city, Croesus tells him, well, it's your city now, They're destroying your kingdom, not mine. And then this leads to the whole, now we're best friends, come hang out in my court business. 
In this version, Cyrus II also says he will grant Croesus a request, any request, and that the former king asked that his chains be taken to Delphi, and that the Pythia be asked why Apollo should have him sent to attack Persia since it doomed him. And the oracle replied that, quote, no one may escape his lot, not even a god. Croesus has paid for the sin of his ancestor of the fifth generation before who was led by the guile of a woman to kill his master. Yeah, things he had no part in, he was still paying for, for the family dues. And that was the whole thing. Ultimately, in that story, I should point out, Croesus does kind of take personal responsibility and recognize, like, oh, I was the one that got the information and acted on it. But here's the thing. All of these stories of Croesus being saved at the last minute are considered these days to be simply useful didactic tales. And some versions of the story actually just say that Croesus was killed when Lydia was defeated. Uh, Those are, like, translations that have been done by other cultures, not, (laughs) not the ones that would be descendants of the Lydians, for example. Uh, The boring reality is that Croesus kind of vanishes from the historical record after the fall of Lydia. Although his grandson Pythias does show up later in the work of Herodotus, he is also very wealthy, although he gets in some very serious and ugly trouble with Xerxes, but that is a whole other thing. As for Lydia, it became a satrapy under Tabalus. But its treasury money kept being managed by a Lydian, which was Pactius. And if you play Assassin's Creed, uh, that name may be familiar to you. As a newcomer to Assassin's Creed, it's not, in fact, familiar to me yet. With the leverage of that satrapy's wealth, Pactius was able to hire Greek mercenaries in a move to revolt against Persian rule, and that ultimately led up to the Persian Wars. Oh, Croesus. Fascinating, yeah. but you, I always got to remember, even in the stories, you know, where it's like, and then he realized that... Living yeah. a good life is better. And I'm like, hey, we got to address this slavery problem. Well, it never, and, never gets addressed. Also, there's a lot of stuff and a lot of historical accounts from this time period that really seem to follow literary convention to a point that you're like, you know, that's probably a little embellished. <laughs> I think this made a good yarn. <laughs> <laughs> but probably not... I mean, I don't want to, you know, invalidate anybody's belief system, but I do not believe that Zeus made a rain cloud go just over Croesus's pyre. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Maybe. I know only that I know nothing. Um, I have a a little bit of listener mail that is um, related to our our White House episode, but is some... fun comedy. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) This is from our listener, Bob, who writes, I just finished part one of your White House episode. Toward the end, you discussed Jackie Kennedy's remodel, and it immediately brought me back to my childhood listening to the Von Meter album, The First Family. And Bob links to it on YouTube. You can find it. And he says, if you haven't heard it, I recommend you do. You may be a bit young, but it is hilarious for anyone who grew up in the 60s and remembers the cultural and political realities and references of the times. As are most things, the sensibilities are reflective of the times. Relevant to your episode, I believe you will find the track 10 minutes, 5 seconds in, where Jackie gives a White House tour especially interesting. I would make an episode suggestion, but you guys seem to be doing just fine. Maybe next time. That is a very, very interesting thing. Uh, Von Meter is someone who is historically very interesting to me. He was a comedian. He became very famous for doing a really good Kennedy impersonation. And so this first family album is essentially a satire, like a satirical version of the Kennedys, uh, including, as Bob mentions, the Jackie Kennedy tour. And it's very much that exaggerated, like, sighing, slightly sleepy-sounding Jackie Kennedy. (laughs) Uh, And he did a couple of albums, actually, um, about the Kennedys, and then, of course, stopped after the assassination because he thought it was in poor taste. But if you are interested in Von Meter, because I really like, uh, you know, old-school comedian stories... Mo Rocca does a show called Mobituaries with Mo Rocca, and he has a great Von Meter episode, so I mm-hmm. highly recommend it. Um, and y- it is a really good Kennedy impersonation. The- that episode that Mo Rocca did starts with a story of uh, somebody who knew JFK in his car, hearing what he did not know at the time was this comedy troupe doing Kennedy. <laughs> And he thought that what he was hearing was something the president was actually saying, and it was temporarily very upsetting. Mm. Um, 
that is the scoop. Go check out that Mo Rocket episode. And also, um, you know, I, I also encourage people, if they haven't done it, to go check out the um, the actual tour that Jackie Kennedy gave for ABC of the White House, because it is quite interesting. I also will say this. We recorded, as I said at the top of that episode, that White House episode, we recorded it in response to the announcement that the Rose Garden was getting redone. And we didn't, We it was completely by accident that it came out like the day of the reveal. <laughs> yeah. I, um, <laughs> that was just a blind luck coincidence yeah. situation. <laughs> Uh, so, like, just to be super clear, like, we had not seen what the actual reveal looked like when we recorded it. Um, and what was kind of hilarious to me was we got, we we QA all the episodes before we released them. And we got all the emails about QAing the episodes, I think, on the day that the unveiling happened. Um, but just because of the way my day worked... Uh, like I, I QA'd all the episodes. It's like, oh, okay, that's really cool. And then I was like, oh, this is funny. Now that I'm looking at the computer again, <laughs> there's what it actually looks like now. It's just super strange and weird. Yeah, I, I don't know about you. I was not expecting it to be finished that quickly after it was announced. It was pretty fast. Yeah, I, I didn't have a good sense of timeline. I did not think it would be done before our episode mm-hmm. came out. Right. But, you know, we've watched enough home improvement shows to know that um, if you get a team of, of very energetic landscapers, they can redo anything in 48 hours. So, sure can. Um, anyway, again, I hope that offered people a little bit of solace if they are chagrined at the new design or if they've been chagrined at any previous redesign. Just remember, it is always in motion. The White House and its grounds were always intended to constantly change. Uh, reassuring. If you don't like the way something is looking at the moment, odds are good. It will change in the future. Yep. Uh, you can write to us if you'd like to. You could do that at historypodcast at iheartradio.com. You can also find us everywhere on social media as Missed in History. And we would love it if you would subscribe to the show. You can do that on the iHeartRadio app, at Apple Podcasts, or wherever it is you listen. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.